I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Series 1, Chapter 4, Shakespeare's Language, Session 3, Repetition of Sounds and Rhetorical Devices Rooted in Structure. The third fundamental method of making sound meaningful is repetition, which refers to any pattern of repeated sounds within a line or passage of verse. Under repetition of sounds, we will distinguish among rhyme, alliteration, assonance, and consonance. Rhyme is the name we give to identical-sounding vowel-consonant combinations at the ends of successive words or phrases. Go, slow. Attest, depressed. Oration, predation. Upper story, lavatory, are all rhyming pairs. Usually rhyme appears at the ends of lines. End rhymes may appear in rhyming couplets, lines rhyming two by two. Here is an example from Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 2, lines 155 to 160. Full thirty times hath Phoebus' cart gone round Neptune's salt wash and Tellus' orbit ground, and thirty dozen moons with borrowed sheen about the world have times twelve thirties been since love our hearts and hymen did our hands unite commutual in most sacred bands. End rhymes may also appear in any number of possible arrangements of alternating rhymes. Here are two examples, the first from A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 3, Scene 1, lines 125 to 128. The woozle cock so black of hue with orange tawny bill the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little quill. The second example is from The Tempest, Act 2, Scene 2, lines 180 to 185. No more dams I'll make for fish, nor fetch in firing at requiring, nor scrape trenchering, nor wash dish. Ban, ban, ca caliban, has a new master, get a new man. Sometimes the poet uses rhymes within lines rather than at their ends. This is called internal rhyme. Here are two examples from Macbeth. The first, a line of the Weird Sisters at Act 4, Scene 4, Line 10. Double, double, toil and trouble. Two doubles and one trouble make for a double internal rhyme. The second example is Macbeth's line at Act 5, Scene 5, Lines 22 to 23. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Where day in yesterdays and way form an internal rhyme in the middles of the two lines. The rhyme scheme of a poem is indicated by giving a letter of the alphabet to each distinct rhyme sound. So the rhyme scheme of Bottom's poem quoted earlier, The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phibus' car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates, would be indicated thus, A, 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 B, C, 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 B. In a future podcast, Chapter 11, I will discuss the normal rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean sonnet. Alliteration refers to the repetition of initial sounds of words, that is, sounds at the beginnings of two or more words in a line or passage of verse. Bottom's lines above are filled with alliteration. The R sound in raging rocks, the SH sound in shivering shocks, shall, and again in shall shine, the M sound in make and mar, the F sound in foolish fates, all are examples of alliteration. Assonance refers to the repetition of vowel sounds within words, as opposed to the beginnings of words. In Bottom's lines, raging, break, gates, make, and fates are all assonant words repeating the long A sound. The repeated short I sound makes prison, shiver, ring, fibus, assonant. The assonance makes the funnier the fact that Bottom is mispronouncing Apollo's name as Phibus instead of Phoebus. Consonance refers to the repetition of consonant sounds within words, 
again as opposed to at the beginnings of words. In Bottom's lines, the N sound in prison and shine is an example of consonants. If we look again at the couplet from Sonnet 94, For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds, Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds, we will find a very rich complexity of sound repetitions. Alliteration on F in for, fester, far, on S in sweetest, sourest, smell, on TH in things, there, than, on W in worse, weeds. Assonance on the long E in sweet, deeds, weeds, on the short E in est, est, there, fester, smell, on the short I in things, lil, and on the U sound in sour, worse. Consonants on the R in for, turn, sour, there, ter, far, worse, on W in sweet, worse, weeds, on ST in sweetest, sourest, and fester. In Series 2, Podcast Y, I'll discuss the overall effect of this complexity in Sonnet 94. One of Shakespeare's great gifts is the ear for weaving all these kinds of repetitions of sound together in complex ways in order to achieve the effects he wants. Here, taken from a play written in the period of his maturity, is an example of Shakespeare's complex use of sound. It comes from the ghost's speech in Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 5, Lines 9 to 13. I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. Notice the alliteration on F, fathers, fast, fires, foul, and D, doomed, day, done, days. The consonants together with alliteration on S, fathers, spirit, certain, fast, fires, crimes, days. On F, in confined. On T, spirit, certain, term, night, fast, burnt. And on D, confined, purged. Assonance on I, night, confined, fires. And A, day, days, nature, away. The repetition of the combinations ER and UR unites assonance and consonance. Certain, term, nature, burnt, purged. The letters D and M tie the word doomed to other words but the vowel, double O, U, is unique in the passage, as if all the other sounds are included in it. Three end-stopped lines, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires, lead to the enjambment of the last lines, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. I'll define end-stopped and enjambed lines in a moment. In the word doomed at the beginning of the sentence, the hardness of the Ds and the force of the long vowel U contrast with the long drawn-out fading of the long A sound in the word away at the end of the sentence. Doomed. Away. More could be said about this remarkable sentence, but the essential point about Shakespeare's use of sound is this. Thanks to his subtle art, we do not experience these figures of speech as mere ornamentation. They are one with the meaning of the words in conveying the intensity of thought and emotion we experience in hearing the sentence. Now let's turn to rhetorical devices rooted in structure. If the key to Shakespeare's imagery is metaphor, the key to his drama is antithesis, meaning the use of contrary ideas, large, small, hot, cold, virtuous, sinful. 
we will discuss the antitheses of character against character, good against evil, knowledge against ignorance, reality against delusion, and so on, in future podcasts. Here I want to focus on the antithesis of image against image. In each of the vast majority of Shakespeare's individual lines, as well as his whole speeches, the meaning is built up out of antitheses, which give dramatic force to the movement of ideas. The theme of Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy is founded on the antithesis expressed in its first six words. The rest of the speech is a set of antitheses contrasting bearing the trials of this life with putting an end to them, leading to the contrast between the known sufferings of this life and the unknown potential sufferings in the hereafter. But let's take a speech that does not seem to be specifically about contrasting ideas. Here's a fairly undramatic passage from Hamlet. It's Act 1, Scene 2, lines 50 to 56. The present king of Denmark has asked Laertes, the son of the king's minister Polonius, what he wishes to do, and Laertes responds that he wants to return to France. King, what wouldst thou have, Laertes? Laertes, my dread lord, your leave and favor to return to France, from whence, though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation, yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Here are some of the specific antitheses that give interest and tension to the passage. Returned to France, came to Denmark. Came to Denmark, bend toward France. Show my duty, that duty done. Willingly I came, thoughts and wishes bend again. My thoughts and wishes, your leave and pardon, and so on. In addition, the whole passage moves in imagination from France to Denmark and back again to France. And it also moves from Laertes' will to the king's will, back to Laertes' will, and again to the king's will. What wouldst thou have? Your leave and favor. My thoughts and wishes? Your gracious leave and pardon. There is no dramatic conflict in the speech or in the relationship and yet the interest of the speech depends on all these contrasting elements. In the couplet of Sonnet 94, quoted before, we can see a good example of Shakespeare's use of antithesis combined with sound to convey drama. For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. Notice the antitheses of sweetest sourest Lilies, weeds, lilies, fester, sweet, fester, sweet, smell worse. The effect of the antithesis between sweetest and sourest is made more pointed because of the alliteration of S sounds, consonants of W sounds, and both assonants and consonants of EST, S sounds. Then the long E of sweetest is repeated in lilies, and the S sounds in fester. The result of this melding of antithesis and sound is a striking image of what it feels like to be betrayed by a friend. Another figure rooted in structure is repetition of syntax or phrasing. Such repetition can express extreme intensity, as in the verse litany of murders perpetrated by the evil king in Richard III, Act 4, Scene 4. Queen Margaret I had an Edward till a Richard killed him. I had a Harry till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard till a Richard killed him. Duchess of York. I had a Richard too, and thou didst kill him. I had a Rutland too, thou helpst to kill him. Queen Margaret. Thou hadst a Clarence too, and Richard killed him. The repetition of words, syntax, and images, in addition to sounds, in Ophelia's verse speech of sorrow over the supposedly mad Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1, lines 160 to 161, is also poignant. O oh, woe is me, 
to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Benedict's comical prose speech in Much Ado About Nothing, Act 2, Scene 3, lines 12 to 18, combines repetition with antithesis. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now had he rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten mile afoot to see a good armor, and now will he lie ten nights awake carving the fashion of a new doublet. This repetition of contrast between Claudio's behavior before he fell in love and his behavior now builds toward the climax in which Benedict asks about himself, May I be so converted? Implying both the desired contrast and the feared similarity of himself to Claudio. Shakespeare pokes fun at excessive repetition of structural elements for rhetorical purposes in a speech in Hamlet, Act 2, Scene 2, lines 96 to 99. The Queen has asked Polonius to use more matter with less art, meaning more substance with fewer rhetorical devices. Polonius responds, Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity. And pity tis, tis true. A foolish figure, but farewell it, for I will use no art. When he says a foolish figure, he means a foolish figure of speech. A third figure, rooted in structure, is chiasmus. The word comes from the Greek letter chi, C-H-I, which is shaped like an X. Chiasmus is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is followed by a mirror image of itself in a structure that can be illustrated as A-B, B-A. Polonius uses it in the speech just quoted in the order of his key words, mad, true, pity, pity, true, mad. Later, Hamlet will say, to punish me with this and this with me. That's Act 3, Scene 4, Line 174. Me, this, this, me. One of the greatest uses of chiasmus in all of Shakespeare is the moment in Richard II, it's Act 4, Scene 1, Line 201, in which the crown is passed from Richard's hand to that of his successor, Henry Bullenbrook, who is deposing him and will become King Henry IV. Bolingbroke asks Richard, Are you contented to resign the crown? Richard's response is, I, no, no, I. This is heard by the audience not only as meaning yes, no, no, yes, but also as I, no, K-N-O-W, no, I, capital letter I, and I, no, K-N-O-W, no, a Y. Yes. I know not myself. I know no way to say yes. The point between the I know and the no I is the turning point of the play, in which the kingship passes from one man to another. It is also the point in the play in which the falling star of Richard crosses the path of the rising star of Bolingbroke. Thus, in a sense, the entire play is built metaphorically in the form of a historical chiasmus, the fall of one king and the rise of the other, and the verbal chiasmus, I, no, no, I, is the X that marks the spot of the historical turning point. Finally, I promise to explain one more rhetorical figure rooted in structure, namely end-stopped and in jammed lines. An end-stopped line is one in which the end of the line corresponds to the end of a grammatical unit or phrase. An enjammed line is one in which the syntax or meaning continues or wraps around onto the next line. Think of a door jam which connects the door to the wall. One line is being connected here to the next line with no pause. In Sonnet 29, beginning when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, all the lines until line 11 are end-stopped. This is in keeping with the speaker's dreary mood. Each line is a depressed instance of his misery. I all alone beweep my outcast state, breath, sigh, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, breath, sigh, 
and look upon myself and curse my fate, breath, sigh, and so on. Then, after he has thought about his beloved, his mood and tone are entirely changed. He's so happy that he is ready to sing, and he does so in the enjambed line. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. After the word arising, which comes at the end of line 11, there is no punctuation to indicate a pause, a breath, or a sigh. But rather the phrase keeps right on going into the next line, just as the European skylark rises into the heavens at dawn to sing, and just as the speaker's mood is now uplifted in joy. It is a classic use of end-stopped verses in jammed lines to embody a contrast in meaning and tone. Shifting from end-stopped lines to enjambed lines is one of the ways that Shakespeare punctuates the difference between the rhymed couplets of the King of France and those of King Lear, discussed earlier under Sound and Sense in Chapter 1, Session 3. The speeches are in Act 1, Scene 1, lines 254 to 265. France Gods, gods, tis strange that from their cult's neglect my love should kindle to inflamed respect. Thy dowerless daughter, king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Not all the dukes of waterish Burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind. Thou losest here a better where to find. King Lear, thou hast her, France, let her be thine, for we have no such daughter, nor shall ever see that face of hers again. Therefore be gone, without our grace, our love, our benison. The lines of France, whose mind is well ordered, are, for the most part, end stopped. Those of Lear, whose mind is in chaos, are in jammed. Here, as everywhere, the figure of speech exists to embody and convey meaning. In the next session, I will discuss the concept of variation in speech and address the question whether Shakespeare's audience got it all. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.